So I have been making a lot of content around bug bounties and just getting into bug bounties and web hacking in general. And I've realized that the channel is starting to lack a little bit of technical content and not because I don't want to make that kind of content, but it's just I'm trying to find the the right balance between creating content that is just helping you all get into hacking and doing the things you want to do in your life with web hacking or bug bounties while sharing my experience. So I want to try something new. I want to start creating content that is just showcasing vulnerabilities or talk about vulnerability types and then later tell you the vulnerabilities I have found or examples of it. But I need to hear from you and I need you to let me know if this is the kind of content that you're interested in or do you just want to hear me get on a camera and ramble about the things that I've enjoyed with bug bounties and the things that I think you should do. So by the end of this video, if you like this kind of content, I need you to let me know. Drop me a comment and say part two, more content like this, whatever you want to call it. So this way I can kind of gauge the audience and understand what kind of content you like the most. Is it the bug bounty and web hacking and the the mentorship aspects of it? Is it the technical aspect? Is it both? I really want to hear from you. Okay, enough about that. Let's talk about SSRF. SSRF or server side request forgery is a very popular vulnerability because it's very impactful and it could give you access to the right things if you export it properly. And the reason why I want to start making a video about SSRF is I'm honestly tired of all the DMs that I get from you guys asking me if a vulnerability that you have found is actually SSRF when in reality it's nothing there, there is no SSRF and the request isn't even being made from the server and it's being made from the client side. So I kind of want to address all of those and on top of it all, I see a lot of people just randomly say check for SSRF in areas that SSRF doesn't even make sense. So for example, I saw somebody posting a login page and asking, hey, what would you do in this case? And the replies were kind of scary because a lot of people were saying stuff like SSRF, uh, which didn't make sense. You know, with a login page, I can't see a reason why that website would be vulnerable, that login page would be vulnerable to an SSRF. And hopefully this video helps you understand that as well. So let's jump into it. Before we do that, we need to talk about what is SSRF. Well, the application that you see on your screen or on your browser with your computer has access to different applications, micro apps, APIs, or backend systems that you do not have the access to interact with directly. So in other words, you tell the website, I want this information. The website or that web server looks at where that information is coming from, whether it's another API that it's internal only and within their internal network, fetches that information and gives it to you. In some other cases, that application maybe have to communicate with the company's continuous integration and development uh, tools that they use, like maybe their Jenkins, their GitHub, their GitLab. Even though you don't have direct access to that, the application itself is connecting to that other application, pulling whatever it needs from it and coming back. So those things are usually gated within an internal network where you have to be in the application itself or you have to VPN into that network in, it, in order to be able to access those. So that's when an SSRF becomes very important and very cool because if that application sits in the middle of those other apps or those other micro apps or internal assets, you can direct that application or the vulnerability with SSRF to fetch data and be able to interact with them. So with that said, we have to first understand how to identify an SSRF. Well, for SSRF itself, it's kind of easy. You have to take a look at your request. So let's jump in. Actually, I'm going to show you on the screen really quickly how that looks. So let's say that you have this website right here and it's asking you to enter a URL and it's going to iframe it. In this case, the iframe kind of is obvious that it's not going to do the server side, but I want to show you the difference between the two. So what we're going to do here is we're going to enter our Burp Suite Collaborator IP address in there. Let's get this right here. And we're going to send a request. And the thing that's going to happen here is it's going to make that request for us. Let's do it one more time. And it's going to show the contents of that in there. And when we pull this, it's going to come back and show us a bunch of IP addresses. I've made a request to this. 
And at the bottom right, the IP address that you see here on the screen is my IP address and not the IP address from the server itself. So that means that the request isn't being made server side and instead it's using our browser to make that request. And I think a lot of times people get confused with an SSRF because they don't distinguish this very exact thing where it tells them, hey, your actual computer and browser made that request. So of course you're not gonna be able to access the internal resources and the internal network that's behind that application. So let's say you were looking at another SSRF. I'm gonna open up this one. And of course, if you're watching this and you wanna play along with these labs, these are from my uh, Nahamsek course. Uh, it's my bug bounty course that I have on Udemy. The labs right here are on my GitHub page. I'll link them down below, both the course and this lab. They'll be on the description. The lab itself is free, you can install it, it's a Docker page, but let's take a look at it. If we make the same request from this server, I'm gonna clear our tab really quickly, and then if I do a pull again, you're gonna see that the request comes back, but this time the IP address is the IP address that it's not belong to me, and it's an IP address that belongs to that server. And you can obviously check all of those by just doing an IP info. So you can go to ipinfo.io, and you can take this information, you can type it in and check where the IP address is. So if you're not sure where this IP address is coming from, you can see that it belongs to DigitalOcean where the server is hosted. So if you're hacking on a company that's hosted on Amazon AWS, that org is gonna be Amazon AWS, which indicates that this is a cloud environment that you could hack into. So that is the first and most important thing to look at when you are trying to find an SSRF is first seeing, hey, where is that request coming from? Is it coming from another server or is it just my browser making that request? Because if it's coming from your browser, then you're not able to access that data. The next thing we're gonna take a look at is just a sample SSRF. A lot of times an SSRF could give you access to a number of different things. The first one is you can actually read internal files. Sometimes it is this easy. All you have to do is give it the file protocol and then you're gonna give it a path to a file that exists. So if it's a Linux machine, you can give it ETC password and it gives you the content or you can just give it a local host and see if there's anything on that local host and if it comes back, it means that you have access to the local host or maybe any other IP addresses that could be internal, for example. If that IP address exists, if you've done some recon maybe, you've found an internal domain maybe, that's a, a corporate domain, you can type it in here, corp.target.com, let's say it's maybe GitHub. So if that domain exists, it's gonna come back and say, yep, I can access it and here is the data for it. A lot of times what you see hackers do in this case, they use a cloud service provider's metadata IP to get information about that server and in some cases, if that metadata IP is accessible, you can actually pull keys for that instance in that machine, especially with Amazon AWS. And that IP address is usually something like 169.254, 169.254. You may not have to put HTTPS there. And we can do metadata. In this case, I am using DigitalOcean, so it might be a little bit uh, harder to get this, but we're gonna eventually find it. And you can see if I put V1, it's showing me all these different names. And if you have access, so for example, if you are on AWS and you have access to the metadata keys, it's gonna have some IAM role here or security folder or something like that that is going to, uh, if you query for it, eventually it's gonna give you the API key that you can use to log into that instance or pull data from that instance using AWS CLI. We're not gonna cover that. I think that's something that you can learn on your own. There are a ton of disclosed reports that talk about this with bug bounties that you can take a look at at how hackers have pulled keys. I've done a whole talk on this, on how to own the cloud using PDF generators and SSRFs. Go check it out, but I just wanna cover the basics of SSRF. So hopefully you guys don't think you have an SSRF when the request is being made uh, server side. But what if it's not that straightforward? What if you are looking at a PDF generator? What if it's a screenshot tool? Or what if your application isn't just showing you the files and folders that you want or the instance that you want it to? The other option you have is, for this example, we're gonna take a look at a screenshot tool. What you can do is you can actually point this domain. So one, the first thing as always to do is Make sure the request is being made server side. I'm gonna do that really quickly. It's gonna say, hey, here's your screenshot. I'm gonna go back to burp. I'm gonna do pull now. 
and you can see the request is coming back again from that IP address. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually point this to a website that we own. So I've made this already. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually see if this website is going to render HTML and JavaScript server side. So the first thing we know already is the request is being made server side. We can't really see any data. For example, maybe they don't let you see local files or something like that and you want to hit the metadata. And what you can do is you can create your own file. So for example, it could be an HTML file. It could be PHP. It doesn't matter. In this case, I'm going to do uh, PHP and I'm going to say, hey, I want you to just create an iframe just for me to test out and see does this thing actually render HTML. In most cases, it does, especially since it's being made server side. But we have to check these one by one. So we're going to go back to Burp Suite. We're going to put our instance for collaborator in here and we're going to see if it's going to load that server side and how it's going to behave. That's always the first step that I use. I use HTML. Then I look at JavaScript as well. So let's see if this is going to work. It's going to do that. And of course it did. It hit our instance with collaborator and we can check that again by going to pull. And we can see more requests have been made. Uh, we are down here now. And of course, the next thing you want to do is you want to check and see if you are able to do anything with JavaScript. And this is where things get more fun because once you have JavaScript, then you can control the behavior of this thing entirely and see what other uh assets you have access to if you do have access to an internal asset for example you can maybe send a post request uh, and be able to modify data or maybe export something internally whatever that is or fetch other data so we're going to send that in and i'll talk about what i just said in a little bit but i want to see if this is going to work and we can see that it says not found which is a great sign because usually that's what the digital ocean metadata instance says as soon as you hit it so we're going to hit this one more time and make our adjustment now that we know it works we're going to go back and we are going to make this request one more time. And as you can see now, we have access to metadata on or the metadata IP instance on the Jira Ocean and we can pull some information and kind of show impact that, hey, this does have access to some internal resources. So that is pretty much the basics of SSRF. And I think it's really important to understand these basic things before you try and exploit them. But before we wrap up the video, I want to give you some other ideas of things you can do, some examples of it, and some areas you can look for SSRF. Number one, any place that you can see a user who could put in a URL where it gives you the ability to integrate your own stuff. For example, if there's webhooks, integration with third-party tools, those are usually a good place to look at SSRF. Any screenshot tool, anytime that you go to a website, maybe they let you design your own code, your own HTML code, and takes a screenshot of it and shows you the output, that is a great place to try. And also, the PDF generators are huge. You can also look for them there. So those are the very common places to look for SSRF. But also keep in mind that everybody is going to be on this cloud provider like AWS, DigitalOcean, or Google. Sometimes these companies may have an in-house thing. So if you don't have access to those IP addresses, go do some reconnaissance, find those internal IP addresses, or find internal domains, and see if you can query for them. For example, I was able to hack in one of the largest retailers in the world by doing exactly SSRF. I was able to hack a third-party tool that they were using. It was self-hosted, it was out of date, it was one of those tools that every company uses, but because it was out of date, it had an SSRF vulnerability on it where I could make a request to local host, but I couldn't pull out any keys. So what I ended up doing was do some reconnaissance and I found out they use another tool, a secondary tool, uh, by finding a domain for it. So let's say if they were using a GitHub, for example, that had a vulnerability that I knew that didn't require authorization, I chained the two together to prove more impact by pulling data. So don't always limit yourself to having a SSRF that needs access to the metadata key. Try things like reading local files. In the first example, I pulled up the ETC password file. In the second example that I just gave you earlier, I chained it with another vulnerability and I saw if I could access internal hosts. So always, always, always think of different attack vectors and attack scenarios where you're not just giving up. And then last but not least, 
not every SSRF or not every server side request is vulnerable. So if you put in your collaborator and you look at it and you see that the IP address that is making the request is not you and it's a remote server, doesn't necessarily mean that it's vulnerable. So you have to really try and show impact. Can you access any internal resources? Can you distinguish if this thing has access to an IP address that's internal? Can you access these things? Can you send data? Can you read data? Or if you can't read data, it could be blind. You can't see the data from it, but can you interact with it with JavaScript and that sort of things? So keep that all in mind when we're looking for SSRF. You don't want to report a false positive to these companies or an SSRF that's not being fully exploited and then just get an NA, a duplicate, or an informative. All right, that's it. I think that was a good explanation of SSRF. I really hope this helps you guys understand what SSRF is, how to look for SSRF even more. And hopefully I see less and less people on Twitter saying, hey, try SSRF in places that it doesn't make sense. And hopefully I get less DMs of you sending me uh, quote unquote SSRFs that are not really vulnerable and it's just being made client side. All right, that's it. I will see you all in the next video. Peace.